Welcome, everyone, to the first in our series of interesting dialogues we're going to have with other futurists. And today we have a very prominent futurist, John Smart, who is you know, just a brilliant thinker in so many areas of futurism. Interesting story about how we got to know each other. Go way back to 2003, he had a conference at Stanford University, and I saw him speak there, and he spoke about his views of the future and uh, technological singularity and so forth, and he had this really good presentation, and I didn't get to meet him at that time, but then for many years afterwards, I kept looking, was he publishing anything new? And there wasn't a whole lot I could find that uh, he was publishing new in the subsequent years from that. But fast forward till about uh, 2017 or so, so I was in this uh, Barnes & Noble bookstore on Stevens <laughs> Creek Boulevard here in Silicon Valley, and as I was leaving, I saw someone checking out some books, and I thought, that person looks familiar. Who was he? Oh, that's John Smart. So let me wait on the side and I'll say hi to him. So I waited about a minute. Um, introduced myself. I said, excuse me, John Smart. And to my delight, he actually knew who I was too. And you know that was uh, surprising to me, but he knew who I was. <laughs> and so we got to know each other. And you know, we met in person a number of times, became good friends um, after that point, and have stayed in touch on topics of futurism. So it's an honor for me to have him over here today speaking to us about all his brilliant insights about the yeah. future and many concepts he's going to go over. So thank you, John. Uh, Karthik, you're too kind. Uh, I found you through your fantastic blog called The Futurist. It was one of the few blogs that was really dealing with this concept of accelerating change openly, honestly, describing the uncomfortable reality that part of it is outside of our control. Part of it seems to be just developmental. It's, that's the term, the word I would use. It's built into the physics of the, and the informatics of the universe. And that was actually the way that I wrote about it in 1999 at a website. It was originally called Singularity Watch. It was the first website on the web talking about accelerating change from a universal perspective. And I started collecting people who thought, wow, this is really interesting. Uh, if this is baked in, then it makes the Fermi paradox even more interesting. If life is fecund throughout the universe and if it's accelerating, and as we know, we're late to the party. We're two thirds of the way out on one of the arms of our Milky Way galaxy. All the Earth likes closer into the core popped out one to three billion years earlier, according to Line Weaver and many other astrophysicists. So, where are they? <laughs> yeah. This, this is a really fascinating question. And uh, I was lucky enough to both think about that question and about accelerating change as a universal process in 1972 as a 12 year old kid in, uh, in middle school. And so finally ended up writing about it in 99 and then doing those conferences, starting a nonprofit called the Acceleration Studies Foundation in 2003 to try and get accelerating change on a scientific footing. And we did those three conferences at Stanford, 2003, 2004, 2005. Three was about the drivers of accelerating change from a technological and universal perspective. Conference 2004 was about the metaverse, and we had uh, you know Second Life and all those other folks. The, the physical virtual interface is how we describe the, the metaverse. It's the most general way of describing it, in our opinion. And then the third conference was called AI and IA, or excuse me, IA and AI, uh, intelligence amplification and artificial intelligence. And I think that's the right framing for technological intelligence. It's all going to start as IA first, it's just these cognitive prostheses like uh, chat GPT. Generative AI is just an extension of how well we use language and data sets on the web. And then it's doing single step inference with that. So it's accelerating our ability to understand all the wisdom we've already put up there in digital space. It's doing a little bit of creative activity. It's also very limited in what it can do. It can't drive cars. It doesn't. It has any self, no self model. It that can't do compositional logic. And most importantly, that isn't being discussed. It doesn't have any sense of emotion. It doesn't have any gut instinct. But I can show you wonderful papers that argue that if you take humans that have had bilateral lesions in their amygdala, so they don't have access to their gut instinct, what do they do? They just argue forever about a topic. They get into analysis paralysis. They can have beautiful logical reasons why I might do this or do that or do it this way. 
can't make a decision because emotions are a state summary of all these incomplete logical algorithms that then give you a direction. Am I going to move toward or away from this? And that state summary algorithm has to be built into the future AIs. And there's so many features of this amazing system that have to emerge in AI for it to become as important as IA, in my view. So anyway, so we did those three conferences and then uh, I was lucky enough to get some funding to go further into this academic study of accelerating change. And my bit, that led me to this view we're going to talk about later of evolutionary development. Uh, because if acceleration is a developmental process, well, we know what evolution is. Evolution is creating variety. It's our left hand of change. It's like Darwin's tree of life. It's constantly creating new things. It can't figure out whether they're going to be adaptive or not. It's experimenting. It's creative. Development's the exact opposite. It's a mirror image. Development in all living systems takes chaos out of a system. In fact, actually uses chaos and contingency to hit a future target in a reliable way on a life cycle. And it turns out we have two sets of genes in our bodies, these evolutionary genes that create variety, make our kids different from us, and these developmental genes that make us all able to talk to each other, make us all human, make us all of, this, of the same species. They hit those future targets reliably. They're the reason why two genetically identical twins you know, are 65% correlated in all their major psychological variables if they're separated at birth. They're only 45% correlated if they're raised together because these evolutionary processes, hey, I'm not going to be like her, make them diversify, but they can only do it to a limited degree because these developmental processes are so predictable. We're going to talk about why you can't get significant life cycle or life span extension in a living organism with its current set of developmental genes because we're built to fall apart at an accelerating rate after sexual maturity and we're imperfect error correctors at the molecular scale. Yeah, so when exactly. You understand, yeah. Thank you. So when you understand these two systems, you see much more and you get out of the, what I call the unrealistic expectations trap of future. Yeah, yeah, because I've been harping against those longevity people for a long time. I mean, I wish I them have. well. They might come up with a good innovation that cures something, but yes, what wonderful. they were saying 20 years ago about where we'd be today, they're not even 10% um, delivered towards by this is why I've had five will have life expectancy this, of yes. 120. This is why I've had public spats with uh, with um, Aubrey de Grey, bless his heart, pushing forward longevity research, helping people understand that yes, rejuvenation medicine is a real thing. He's an editor of a journal called Rejuvenation Medicine. Yes, lots of parts of our bodies can rejuvenate. Our liver is an amazing rejuvenator. Uh, you can cut the tip of a fingernail off of a person by accident before the age of before puberty. And some 5% of the time, it'll grow back like a starfish. How is that possible? Because we have these, we have these rejuvenation capacities. Can't do it for the brain. It's a post-mitotic system. So that system's going to just fall apart. Or you can, best you can do is just try and keep it youthful a bit longer, which J.L. Shansky calls squaring the curve of aging, pushing it out forward. So all the work that Strategies for Engineered Negligible, Negligible Senescence Foundation, the SENS Foundation, and others will do, it's the wonderful work that could get us 20, 30 years more health span, can't fix the system. You have to understand it at the genetic level to reorganize it. That's going to require uh, advanced AI, possibly quantum level AI. Right? Absolutely. And even the That's 20, 30 years more health span is taking a lot longer than they said it would because it's a heavier lift. Yes, well said. And it's so multifactorial. And the tools that work today, like intermittent fasting, people don't want to do because they're difficult. So, yeah. Yeah. So much going on there. Anyway, so that gives you an overview of kind of how we met each other. And I just loved your work on, uh, you know, trying to time the singularity. And uh, we're going to talk later about what my timing is and why it's a little different from, you know, the 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 rational altruists that you'll find out the effective altruists and the other the trans most of the transhumanists uh i think it's later than they think but see i'm a futurist so where i went after starting that uh organization was i went back to school and got a second master's in uh in foresight i want to talk about that in a minute i'm sure yeah um so um going to say earlier in your life you mentioned 1972 was when you had one degree of awareness. 
Mm -hmm. And then after that, there was um, Cosmos, Carl Sagan, 1980, although his Cosmic Calendar was in his books before then. So at what point did you feel you had become aware of the accelerating rate of change and that um, you tried to explain it to other people and they would only get a small fraction of it or not at all? Right. Well said. That, well uh, said. A lot of futurists go through. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Well, you know, for me, I was so lucky. I went to a... a a wonderful prep school, college prep school called Chadwick School in Palos Verdes, California, where I grew up. My dad was in computers. Um, my mom was working with him, too. She was at IBM, and so was he beforehand. So I, they grew up in big iron computing, and then my dad was doing personal computing. So I got to see the Moore's Law up close as it exploded, you know, through the mini computer and then the PC uh, revolution. And I was lucky to, in 72, to see a cosmic calendar. Uh, it was either my chemistry or my biology professor had it on the wall. I think it was chemistry. I think it was geology. There was these geology calendars that included like life, life forms. And then they show you that like, okay, so we're this tiny little blip on the end of the 12 month calendar. If you put 13.5 billion years of universe's history on there and everything emerges, everything accelerates after June, right? And so yeah. why, 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 why? Sagan said in in his book Dragons of Eden, which didn't come out till seventy seven, which I read I think seventy eight. It's a phenomenon. This is his phrase, or I might have said it in a in a interview. It's a phenomenon that science needs to understand. You and I both recognize that. I started Acceleration Studies Foundation basically to put the plant the flag and say, look, acceleration studies needs to become a new academic discipline. Now that yeah. never happened. It never happened. It I, never happened. You... It still doesn't happen. It's science that needs to understand it. Technology yep. and economics. Certainly. Yes, I had 20 years. I had 20 years, and now we're converting the name of the ASF to, to uh, Evo Devo Institute. Because for me, understanding acceleration as a developmental process is more fundamental. And it gives us the frame for understanding adaptive acceleration versus non-adaptive. What, what things do we want to accelerate? What things do we want to put speed bumps in front of so that when they finally emerge, we'll have these other systems, these network systems that we're going to discuss that will that will manage those accelerations. So for me, understanding adaptiveness, evolutionary and developmental adaptiveness, that that became the fundamental insight. But back to my original uh, kind of breakthrough for me or my, you know, Eureka, whatever you want to call it, moment, 72. So I so I saw that calendar blew me away. And then I was had the good fortune of having like summer national geographics. I was flipping through all these national, going back to like 1890 at my school, right? And I was thinking about this acceleration and I was thinking like, so why is it universal? And it just suddenly hit me that all the interesting things in the universe that are more complex have emerged in increasingly local zones of space and time. So large scale structure first after the system expands, then galaxies, then special replicating suns within those galaxies, creating the most complex systems, building out the periodic table, then special metal rich planets surrounding those uh, population one stars, third generation stars, right? Uh, with liquid water, allowing uh, organic chemistry, these incredibly long molecules. It's the Lego block. Uh, uh, carbon is right boron silicon yes. can't do it can't do it only carbon can do it and so then it's bacteria right archaeobacteria in in volcanic vents current model the earliest and then where is bacteria what's bacteria's range it goes miles deep in the crust bacteria probably even went to other planets as ejecta from planetary meteorites hitting earth and skipping off as spores we know spores can survive in the vacuum of space it's so hard yes. okay so then we get multicellular life, Cambrian explosion, then we get this small subset that develops tool use, pro-sociality, and the ability to see ahead, right? Executive function in the brain, swinging trees, very complex environments where you have to predict the future, perfect, perfect breeding zone in all Earth-likes for long-term thinking. Then holding those rocks in their hands, pro-sociality is the key, right? We were all eaten by leopards until we were all holding these rocks in our hands. And they found, they found quarries, old one tools with a thousand of these flaked rocks. 
being made at a time. So an so think of that, an assembly line for tools made two million years ago. Why? Because we're deeply social. We're a network creature. We knew that if we handed them out to everybody, now we were the baddest ass creatures on the on the on the savanna. Finally, right? Didn't yeah. have to be thicker skinned. Didn't have to be faster. All we needed was foresight, tool use, and sociality. The three great, three great gifts. And so, what I realized when I saw these increasing zones of locality is okay. So then that explains cities. It explains why cities are out competing. You know, countries with more density outcompete less density. It explains the rise of corporations. It explains the rise of increasingly complex technology and increasingly miniaturized technology. Exactly. And, and so, it, despite all so many counter forces that have always called for decentralization, that while it exists is not enough to overpower the centralization of cities and high density places that you mentioned. Yes, although, you know, I would use the term centralization and decentralization not from locality perspective in this case. I would just call that localization versus delocalization. What I would call it, say, is that within any locale, there's going to be two sets of fo forces. There's going to be evolutionary forces that inherently decentralize by creating all this bottom-up, these new bottom-up actors in a network. Then there's going to be developmental forces that inherently centralize and create scale, right? And so there's times in the evolution of, of uh, technology where we wanted to centralize big iron, then we decentralized with many computers, uh, then we centralized around a lot of the software stacks for those, then we decentralized with personal computers, and then further with the internet, and now we're massively centralizing under these tech titans. And AI started up as a hugely centralizing force. Only the powerful people have access to it. I'm predicting that AI is going to decentralize into these personal AIs. So that's all happening in these special locales. Everything's getting more localized and miniaturized. But at the same time, there's this kind of titanic struggle between evolutionary and developmental forces, we need them both and at different times, right? What we need now, I would argue, is something open source to counter these centralized AI actors. And I'm calling it IA, actually, right? It's, but everyone else calls it AI. Yeah, absolutely. These first generation AI it's going to come to pers the personal AI, which we're going to talk about later in this thing. It was like, how does that change society when we get that next new massive decentralizing force within this highly concentrated, you know, city? The future of the future of this amazing uh, thing that we're building, uh, and you know, it is a super organism. We're going to talk about that too. Network theory is all about well, networks always win. That's, I'm just going to give you the. I'm going to give you the lead. Okay, networks always win in complex systems. Individuals are cool; they create variety. Groups are cool; they enforce conformity. Those two processes blend to create and are organized into diverse networks of individuals and groups. And it's the network perspective that is always the best for truly understanding acceleration and adaptiveness. Example. We had major six major uh, catastrophes that have affected life, right? The Great Oxygenation event, which everyone forgets, and then the other five, which they talk about, the Permian, et cetera, right? In, in two of those, Great Oxygenation and Permian, 95% of all the species roughly disappeared. Yes. What, what happened to the network complexity at the genetic level? Go down one level, nothing, nothing. What, that network complexity was redundantly stored in all these different organisms. The gen developmental complexity wasn't touched. Maybe a little bit of evolutionary yeah. complexity disappeared. Maybe a few unique genes. But what ended up happening was as soon as that major catastrophe happened, let's talk about Permian, for example, volcanic eruption, for example, the ones that could survive that catastrophe, suddenly they had all this new resource space. And what did they do? They flourish to create this incredible new complexity very shortly after the catastrophe. Same thing happened with the KT meteorite, where the mammals have been around for 50 million years, sitting under the dinosaurs, not able to do anything. Everything was in stasis. 
catastrophe, punctuation in the punctuated equilibrium cycle. Suddenly, massive new complexity. Yeah, uh, and in uh, an extremely mammals. short time, yes, um, they filled all economic niches. Adaptive radiation, which itself yes. happens faster and faster after each catastrophe, and we see that even in human society now. So there's a term for this. It's a really cool term. Now, punk, punctuated equilibrium, or what the evolutionists call punk eek, right? That's one. But the, the, you know, systems stay like this until some kind of disruption pushes the net, or some new internal development finally allows the threshold for the new uh, punctuation, right? Equilibrium, equilibrium, long time, punctuation short. Another term is hormesis. That's a really cool term. So hormesis is a stress that makes the system stronger. Right? It's not resilience. Resilience is super important. You get resilience from diversity, from redundancy yeah. and diversity. You can snap back. Hormesis is a, is a subset of resilience. Resilience. It's a stress that's within the, de the design uh, limitations of the system that will actually make you stronger. That's lifting weights. That's uh, why your bones get stronger with, you know, under gravity. That's why, uh, that's how uh, circulatory, respiratory, uh, your cognitive, all, yeah. If you, all if you of do our brain, complex puzzles as you age, then you stave off a cognitive decline. You do the exact. Yes, you do yeah. even more. You do even more. You do what you said earlier. You make the system stronger. You mm -hmm. actually accelerate adaptiveness in the short period right after. And so, what is that? That's hormesis. That's the best word most people don't know. A hormetic system, or hormesiance, or hormesiant. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not resilient. It's so much more even awesome. Now there is a term, anti-fragility. It's the only term out there that maps to this, right? Yeah, and that seems to have anti-fragile. Um... He doesn't quite get it, though, because he says things that gain from disorder. They gain from disorder and stress. And yeah. your immune system is the best example, even more than your, than your brain, I think. So mm -hmm. how do you build those kind of hormescient systems, right? How, how do you, you have to truly see that process operating at all these levels and it's always you have to always realize it's the network that's always winning so fall of rome dark ages what happened to, to technological r d well it just migrated to the middle east because all those scrolls were redundant enough just like the gene networks in the in the in the uh, permian right there yeah, scrolls... at the world level there was no interruption at all Exactly. So this is Kurzweil's beautiful smoothness of the of the of the uh, of the curve. It's because of the network. So the deeper we see, how do we build this network adaptiveness? That requires this evolutionary and developmental perspective, in my opinion. So back to acceleration. There's three major drive four four ma major drivers we can look at. We can simplify it and say there's just two. Okay networks and then these physical in informational drivers right but the physical and informational can be split again the physical drivers are localization and miniaturization so cities and nano if you can get things closer together in space or if you can miniaturize them right take a process like fertilizer creation sure you can scrape uh, bat guano uh, off of uh, an island like we did forever, or you can actually grab it right out of the air with the Haber-Bosch process in 1910. Just fix, use ammonium to fix nitrogen right from the air. And even more efficient than that would be the, the, the nitrogen uh, fixing, the nitrogen fixing nodules on soybeans to take those genes and put those into a plant so it can self-fertilize the way uh, from the air, just the way nitrogen does. And what is that? That's just more and more efficiency, smaller and smaller scale, getting right down to the quantum scale, like the way the crystals that do photosynthesis, photosystem one and two in our own bodies work, right? They use quantum effects. Mm -hmm. uh, no, sorry, not in ours, in plants, right? How is that possible? It's because the universe allows this incredible miniaturization as well as the localization so that's the great promise of nanotech as drexler and others have talked about so those two monitoring those two and actually getting policymakers aware of those how much more of the good accelerations would happen if we truly understood those two physical drivers then there's the informational drivers we can split those two because the universe is not just about physics it's about creating information more and more com complex information too absolutely right? yeah 
So digitization and simulation are the two that I think are the main drivers for human civilization. If you can Absolutely. take take things in the physical world and and measure them and turn them into bits, that's going to create a whole new ecosystem for those bits that is almost dematerialized. It's almost ind resource independent. It can go so fast. But then add simulation to that, do computation with those bits, do modeling with those bits. And now you have intelligence, you have representation, you have consciousness, which is one form of simulation. You have the metaverse, which is another form, you know, the digital twins, uh, virtual models. And then you have just classical AI and all the, all the algorithms that we use for representing things in informational space. So if we truly cared about, truly cared Oh, and then the last thing we have to say is those two, those, those drivers, those LMDS drivers, localization, miniaturization, digitization, simulation. So a few people saw them early, like Nick Negroponte in 90, 1998 with his book, Being Digital. Okay, digitization, he got that. Hardly anybody got, got simulation. Virtually nobody got uh, localization. Drexler got miniaturization, but he didn't understand that that's gated by AI. You can't create these these nano assemblers. It's just, it, unfortunately, it's just as realistic as this idea that you know we can live forever, right? It's like yeah. life figured it out. So you either have to take a synthetic biology route to create the, what are called soft machines. Uh, Richard Johnson, Soft Machines, is one of the best books on nanotech because he says, look, this is a, you have to understand how life does it, how life is error corrector, and how life keeps these systems replicating at these super small scales. So you either got to do that. Or you got to have super advanced AI to do it outside of life. Either way, it's like, no, that's that's way out in the future. But so certain people saw pieces of them, but I think unrealistic expectations can really hurt some of the futurism in that area. The, the phrase yeah, I love- Yeah, and bias towards what a person's original field of study was and therefore seeing point. everything through that lens. This idea of being a systems theorist, right? A systems yeah. theory is the beautiful phrase for this Stuff we're talking about right now, which is not philosophy, not science. It's in the space in between. It's a subset of philosophy trying to become science, hoping to become science. All of our acceleration study stuff, we are hoping to become established science based on physics and information theory. But our, as, as has been said many times, we have no Einstein of information theory. We have Einstein of physics. Our understanding yeah. of information, meaning, and complexity it's still baby steps, man. And that's why I think this Evo-Devo theory is so helpful. And this network theory, understanding that networks are at the center of this acceleration, that means network science has got to get much better, much better than it is today. If you've read Barabasi's Linked or any of these other wonderful trade books on networks, that's the future that it has to go. It has to go so much deeper and it has to truly tie into yeah, exactly. simulation and representation, which which is not right now. It's just talking about links and nodes and, you know. Yeah, they're and, still using neural networks and convolutional neural network belief systems that are 40, 50 years old. And the exactly. uh, basis of a modern AI is still using that in 80% of the cases. I'm thinking. Yeah. Oh, and yet, look how complex this thing is, right? Exactly. Look how complex it is. It's like, you know, the universe created that. You know that tech is going to is going to recapitulate that in a tiny fraction of the time astro, astro, from an astrophysical perspective, but it still could be decades or centuries from our time, which is why you and I care so much about increasing understanding and increasing the good accelerations, right? Yeah. The, the, now, the good, on the topic the good. of acceleration itself, like taking it back a little bit, so uh, Carl Sagan's uh, books and TV series watched by hundreds of millions of people. They yep. may understand it in the moment, then they forget about it, right? Yes. And yes. a lot, and still to this day, very, very few people truly understand this accelerating rate of change or even think about it, especially now in the 2020s where there's so much evidence that's visible. I could forgive someone yes. for not really caring back in the 1920s because it was not relevant to their day to day life. But now, still, very few people get it or think about it or even think it should be integrated into every other aspect of thought. And what do you attribute that resistance to and how there's surprisingly few people who are truly aware of this subject and even fewer contributing to it? If, um, if I were to list people who are right now putting out good material on accelerating rate of change, 10, 15, 20 people, including the two of us, it's not much well, more. Well, there's... 
Yes, there's many ways we could try and answer that fantastic question. Uh, try and go to some deep reasons. One of them is that it's scary. So it's, it's, it's a scary phenomenon that we don't like. It's disruptive, and we don't like think we, we like to think about equilibriums more than we like to think about punctuations. We, we hope things are going to stay homeostatic. Another reason is it doesn't fit with biology. Biology always is on an S-curve, logistic growth. So it runs out of resources eventually or space. What we're talking about is something that jumps to smaller and smaller scales of space, time, matter, and energy. So it's continually escaping resource limits. It's a, it's a second order curve that traces these, S, these individual S-curves. Each individual fixed finite system is gonna saturate in what it can do and how fast it can go and what it can understand. But then we're continually using LMDS to just dive in to these smaller and smaller scales. The best absolute example of this is quantum computing. It just totally blows my mind that fat fingered, you know, primates like us can make these multi qubit quantum computers that the universe allows this. And those computations don't even respect space and time. They are instantaneously entangled. They are so far down in inner space that they're operating under different dynamics. The big insight that I had in 72 when I was flipping those Nat, Nat Geos was that the natural limit of this acceleration is something that looks like a black hole. And black holes had only recently been discovered. Uh, 71, I think, was when they were first talked about. Yeah. 72, at 72, there were pictures in Nat Geo. I think the first one, Cygnus X1 or something, I forget which one it was, but like suddenly I got it. Now, that's, that is a super elegant explanation for the para Fermi paradox, is that everything goes inward, and black hole physics is still so poorly, and informatics are so poorly understood. There's Read uh, Brian Cox's new book on black holes, and he'll show you all the different kind of theories that are fighting with each other. And, you know, one of them is that they're all topographically connected to each other. Another one is that they're ultimate computing devices. Another, uh, that's Seth Lloyd from 1999. Another one is that they are seeds for new universe creation. Hmm. That's, that's uh, Lee Smolin's view. So what if they are topographically connected, the so-called Einstein-Rosen bridge, right? Then going in, not only do you create kind of the most accelerated complexity you can locally, both evolutionary and developmental, none of it's ever godlike. It's a physical system. So it's just... More advanced version of us in this view, right? So these got these fundamental dynamics, creation and then protection of the system under replication cycle. But now they can meet all the other ones doing the same thing and compare and contrast their finite and incomplete simulations prior to doing another replication in the in the multiverse. And the or, unspoken or, other assumption there is that there's a immediate much faster than light communication between them because obviously many of those black holes are very, very far apart, but they're um even the interactions between them are, are instantaneous and therefore much faster than this. Actually, actually, that's one possible assumption. Another way to, a more conservative way to interpret the physics is that if you're at the surface of a black hole, if you go and you inhabit that space, suddenly you instantly merge with all the other black holes in your local vicinity. Not all the ones in the universe because of dark energy, but we currently understand that, that Andromeda and the Milky Way are going to they're going to uh, connect to each other. Yeah. So in uh, they're all going to merge, and everything's going to going to fuse inside of single black holes. That's the current dynamics, right? Uh, supermassives suck everything in, and then, then they all fuse. So what is what does that look like in black hole time? That's instantaneous. You go to that space, and everything outside the universe is happening like instantaneously fast, and you're sitting there like you're frozen from the perspective looking outside, right? So, yeah, it's not clear at all what the actual physics are, but if it does allow that connectivity, then you've got these three great reasons, at least, why you would go to that space. The fourth one, which is looking out, you see everything as a perfect eye. Looking out as you're sitting on the horizon, you see everything else that's happening, so you get to update your incomplete simulations, you know, put a few little dots on the you know, a few more decimal places on whatever, but still, you're not God. You're still a finite system that wants to meet all these other systems, it's still network dynamics that are at play. 
that explains why there's so much isotropy and par massive parallelism in the universe, that it would be just like this system, massive isotropy and massive parallelism, because each of the systems arguing with each other, each of these sub subnets, none of them are ever godlike. They're all computationally incomplete. So maximizing evolutionary variety and keep staying on the developmental cycle are two fundamental things you would do. And the evolutionary variety thing tells you why you'd never send out a, a, a robot probe on the way into the hole. If you send out an Encyclopedia Galactica or a replicating robot probe, everyone who got it goes down their hole in the same way you do, and you just suck all the evolutionary variation out of the system. So evolution hates monoclonality, so, that, so some kind of a prime directive would emerge preventing you from doing that. And this is, I wrote all this up in late, you know, I wrote it up in 2002 in a uh, paper called Answering the Fermi Paradox for a uh, uh, Journal of Evolution and Technology. Yeah, and we I, have URLs for that um, in the description yeah. box below this video as well. Thank you. And then I wrote it up again in uh, 2012 in an uh, astrophysical journal call, uh, and, and I titled it Answering, I, I titled it uh, The Transcension Hypothesis. That, you know, intelligence goes to inner space, not outer space. And that to me is one of the biggest mistaken assumptions, not just the longevity one. But to me, one of the biggest ones is this belief that complexity goes to outer space. It goes a little bit, just enough to create the next adjacent complexity, and then it goes even deeper in, inward. And so if you Google transcension hypothesis on YouTube, you'll find like 20 videos people have created since I wrote that paper in 2012, because they think it's a cool possible solution to the Fermi paradox. But as you may know, there's 75 solutions out there. The book... Yeah. Um, why we the book where are we or, or no where is everybody by stephen webb lists all 75 and he and to his credit he he considers mine one of the most interesting and testable of the 75 that's because, fascinating that's one of the tremendous accolades that you know people a century from now will will look back and say oh yeah john you. smart's <laughs> thank you john smart thought of this much with the extremely limited resources of his era that we had yeah <laughs> it just it just feels like more uh parsimonious to me just like all intelligence in the universe was created in a replicating fashion seems parsimonious yeah. because because we were created in an Evo Devil fashion, so why wouldn't we live in an Evo Devil universe? But yeah, well, I, Galileo I said that, right? He said that um, the universe uses as universe uses as little of any ingredient as possible to do whatever it does. Ah, okay, very nice. So, yeah, the efficiency and that that was sixteen oh nine or whatever when he said that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so that's the transcension hypothesis, and we don't necessarily you know, create a new universe. We might just go to something like a, me a hyperverse, a metaverse, go into the multiverse, uh, that beautiful Flammarion uh, woodcut where you see people sticking, uh, you, see a, a, you see a 16th century farmer sticking his head through the celestial sphere and then he sees yeah. stuff outside of it. <laughs> That's really, that feels to me correct because living systems partition their intelligence into three things, the seed, which replicates the organism, which unfolds, and the environment it's embedded in. We partition so much of our intelligence. I partitioned it into all these futurist books behind me, right? I partitioned it into all of the tools that I am using. So that's so-called um, niche construction or ambient intelligence, right? Uh, that yeah, is that, that's of sort of what I'm doing with this YouTube channel as well. There you go. Different there you niches. Go. Yeah, and, you know, it violates our... the advice of normal YouTubers saying you have to focus on one niche. And I'm saying, no, 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 no. Even if it takes much longer, I have to have many niches because I believe they're all Good related. For you. Good you know? for you. I think you're taking the network perspective, not just the yeah. systems, but you're taking the network perspective saying, look, none of us can ever understand the whole, but we can try to see as much of the network as we can and then optimize our activities within it and realize that we're not responsible for the whole network. The network's always winning. We don't have to stress like some of these effective altruism people do. Oh, I got to save the planet. No way, man. The planet is saving itself. Yeah. And we nothing you do to... or don't do is going to move the needle. Well, <laughs> is, is, is it, what it, they should see. It will it. only happen if virally a bunch of other people take that influence and do something big, which is great. You know, everybody, everybody's playing a piece, but it's the arrogance that any that the system depends on any one of them, and it's the fear 
that there's these things that could knock the whole system off. So I have to be, you know, I have to take this dramatic savior uh, perspective. Yeah. No, that's not how the system works, man. The better you understand it, you can become what I what I call a gardener. You can lead like a gardener. So the future that matters is the flourishing future, which is e even cooler term than prosperous, yeah. which is useful. That's 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 economic, or thriving, which is mental and and values based. Pro uh, flourishing, the flourishing future is comes from the root flower to a seed, right? That grows into a, a, a grows into something. Yeah. So we are actually Johnny and Jane apple seeds. We're putting all these wonderful seeds out and we're just trying to water them. All these people who see all of your videos from now until, you know, uh, the end of time <laughs> and the AIs that, that surface the pieces that matter to them under the right context, all that stuff is planting seeds for a greater awareness for the whole system to adjust itself. And we don't have to be responsible for that whole system. What we have to see is that it's actually accelerating and improving itself. And we can make small adjustments. And, you know, I, I, I write these things about policy changes I would love to see, but none of them are um, existential, none of them. They're not existential risks. The The system is deeply self-adaptive, and I am a network as well, right? Absolutely, because I tell people that uh, let's just take one uh, disaster event that's well-known, that Cretaceous Paleogene disaster event 66 million years ago. And as we know, you know, 97, 98% of all tetrapods and all that went extinct, and, and everything had to redirect. But because there was adaptive radiation, uh, our modern high-tech uh, society, well, whether it would be humans or not, or just advanced intelligence to the extent we are now, that might have happened 10 million years later, if not for that asteroid impact. So instead right. of 66 million years subsequent, that might be 76 million years. And where the Earth is today might just be where we were in 10 million BC. And yes, there were other stress events after that that were smaller, but also added to that. But I just give that as an example of how the adaptive radiation Mm -hmm. curved things a little bit forward than might have otherwise occurred. So we should probably jump into foresight here because this is a good time to talk about it. So I wrote this book, Introduction to Foresight. It's a six-year process. Yeah, it's uh, a fantastic book. It's over 500 pages. I've read a lot of it, the vast majority of it, and it's as close to an encyclopedia of futurist concepts as one could produce. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. You know, we finished, uh, I recommend anybody who's interested in foresight, there's 27 places you can get a degree in it around the world. The oldest one is the University of Houston, uh, started in 75. That's where I got my master's in strategic foresight. And there's like 500 graduates, a nice alumni network. So you'll meet other cool people who like thinking about the future. And future, futurism or, or foresight uh, or future thinking uh, professionally breaks into just two things, foresight and futures. Foresight are the tools you use to try and look ahead. And ideally, you're doing them before you start strategy. So foresight, the elevator pitch for foresight is anything you do before strategy. And you, you talk to somebody in an organization, if they don't do anything before strategy, then suddenly their ears will go, oh, wait a minute, what can I do? Well, lots. I can collect all these uh, industry reports, I can look at trends, I can try and figure out what the key drivers are, I can try and find out the key uncertainties in those drivers and then generate scenarios around those uncertainties and two axes or more. I can uh, do a prediction market and have people have skin in the game for actually making probabilistic bets. I can do first principles analysis, try and build some models. I can, do, I can simulate, I can do war games. Uh, I can do argument mapping amongst the whole group, find out the areas where people agree and all the areas where they disagree and, and put it up on a map. All that stuff is foresight. There's about 150 really useful tools, and I list them in there that you could, under different circumstances, you might use. So what's futures? Futures is simpler. That's just the stories we trade in all the different areas we care about. And the science fiction people are writing them, the people who are creating propaganda are writing them. Everybody is writing their own 
set of future stories and trying to sell those. And then pe we critique them. We talk about that. And different people like, some people are attracted to the foresight, the tools and, and practices and models, and some people attracted to the, to the stories. So I decided to write a book about tools focused on personal, team, and individual levels in systems, in complex systems, right? Ourselves, our, our immediate relationships, our direct reports, our family, our superiors, and then organizationally. All those tools I just mentioned are typically organizational foresight tools that people would use. But you can use subsets of those tools for teams, and you can use them for yourself. And then the last thing you should say is that horizons, thinking about the future, follows a power law. Yeah. We think about the future mostly between now and the end of day. And mostly it's the, the next few seconds. And most of it's all unconscious. The so-called predictive processing model of, of neuroscience tells us that we're constantly predicting ahead. And then we squirt dopamine if we predict correctly. And we hush the dopamine for about five seconds, which is an agonizingly long time for a brain. If we mispredict, if I reach my hand up to touch you and you pull your hands back, I'm going to hush all my dopamine uh, releasers for five seconds. Oh, I mispredicted. So I'm going to punish myself rather than reward myself. So emotion is deeply tied in, positive and negative, right? All the, all the complex emotions to prediction, to true thinking ahead. And so... I think we can use these tools and I describe, you know, the social psychology of them and how you want to feel optimistic first and then pessimistic and then make a plan. That's called sentiment contrasting. A wonderful psychologist named Gadrail Ottingen figured that out. Uh, go to whoop my life, W O O P my life.org. And you can see some of the tools she has for sentiment contrasting. Uh, you know, feel first, think second and feel the positive and negative in balance, and then make your plan with an if-then statement. If this problem comes up, then I'm gonna do this. And what she's shown is you're twice as able to predict what you're gonna get done today or the next week, and you get uh, more than twice as much done. And when tough obstacles come up, you jump over them because you did the right kind of future thinking. So that's all foresight, those are all methods. And that's the last thing I wanna say about my book is, Love, love you guys to check it out and um, tell me what you think of it. Give me some feedback for because I'm going to re keep revising it. But my second book is called Big Picture Futures. And that's looking at the stories we're trading at three higher levels. So personal, team, and organizational. Now I'm going to do social, global, and universal. Right? And like those, we don't really have a good science for uh, the social science. Or, uh, or, or global is super organism. You know, how do we all interact with each other as a single species? And then universally, what are these features of complex systems that we expect are going to be operating in all other life forms? And that's more speculative. And some people are not, not that interested in future stories, but you and I are. And so, uh, you know, I'm looking forward when that book comes out, hopefully I can come back on and we can talk about that too. Absolutely. Now, if someone is in an organization and not like the, the CEO or the big boss and they want to at least get more people in their organization interested in the seed of thinking of foresight for corporate strategy, um, improving the performance of the business, and a lot of the stuff we've spoken about would not sell within a corporate setting. People wouldn't yeah. know uh, what's going on. So what advice would you give them for how to begin, how to go in baby steps, how to get more um, receptiveness to foresight type thinking for their well, strategic business goals? Nice. I have an appendix. That's why I wrote the first book, because it's really not about this big picture stuff we've been talking about. It's about the small tools we use for thinking better today. And, you know, like, like a, so I have a whole appendix in that book that, appendix one, that has a one-hour worksheet, foresight skills journal, basically, where you journal with yourself. And you answer these questions. You, you uh, can take this test if you want, a strengths finder test. And then I've updated it by adding foresight strengths that strengths finder missed. And you can start to see where your strengths are in how you think ahead. And then you can start improving those, and then you can start improving your relationships. And then 
you can start managing your or your teams and your organizations better. And that's and in so, the appendix of the of the, yeah. your book. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I want the, the sentiment contrasting that I just mentioned, you know, feeling positive and then feeling negative and then making a plan. That's one of the tools that's really simple, very easy to use. But remember, most of your foresight is now till the end of day. So if you want to get better at thinking ahead and predicting what you're actually going to get done, you want to use the tools we talk about in there. And then you get better at short term foresight, which is tomorrow to the next three months. That's called the T's. And then yeah. as you start getting better at tomorrow, the next three days, the end of the week, then suddenly you're actually m making some meaningful improvements for the next quarter. You're not just flailing around or just responding to your environment like most people do. You're actually yeah, being yeah. proactive. Most people are in firefighting mode, and before they know it, it's 4 p.m., and there's not enough time to do what they really wanted to get done. As I describe in the book, yeah. the three major things that will pull you off your plan, you make your plan in the morning, nice little plan, Fears, fires, and fancies. You're scared of something, so you procrastinate it. A fire comes up, you're a manager, you got to put it out, but then you forget to go back to plan. Yeah. And fancies, the other big one. Oh, that looks interesting. Let me go down that rabbit hole, you know, and then or you know, an hour, an hour later. said, let's go get a coffee, and then right. that's fun, but that uses up an hour and a half. <laughs> exactly. An hour later, and your time that you had is burned up. Yep. And so... There's a wonderful book called Indistractable. My book lists about hmm, 200 other books that you should consider. I, I try and describe why they're valuable. Now, you might not read all those 200. You might read two of them. Yeah. But you'll you'll look at my descriptions of them. You say, "Oh, that particular book I should read." A book exactly. is the that's most... why I said um, to the extent there's a, there's an encyclopedia of futurism and all associated Thank you. material that is this Thank and the you. world has needed this for a long time. <laughs> Thank you. I'm doing my yeah. best. It's an update from of uh, a great book called Foundations of Future Studies, which was came out at the end of the last century by the great Wendell Bell, the futurist uh, sociologist at Yale. And he broke his futures uh, text into the same two topics, uh, tools and then what is a good society was his second book, you know, because goodness, that's one of these topics, We one of these future stories. We have to trade back and forth. What is goodness? And I think goodness is a deeply network level perspective. Two books I want to recommend on that, well, a single book I want to recommend is Peter Turchin's Ultra Society, How 10,000 Years of War Made Us the Best Cooperators on the Planet, Paradoxically. How does that happen? How does the catastrophe of war act hormetically to strengthen human cooperation and strength of the human network? But basically, he argues that if the listeners have ever done HIT, High Intentionally Interval Training, you know that if you do that in the same amount of time as you normally would do your, your exercise, so 30 minutes of running, normal rate, or 30 minutes of two-minute sprint followed by a recovery long enough for your heart rate to come back down to normal, and then another two-minute sprint, and then another recovery for it to come back down to normal, and you spend your 30 minutes that way. What's the difference between those two, those two stressors? Turns out that the second one, the HIT, increases your your peak power, increases your top speed, increases your VO2 max, it increases your recovery time. You just need seconds to recover instead of you might have taken minutes before. Yeah. And lastly, it it it, excel, it improves your immune function. Your actual immune function gets stronger. Yeah, and, and the, that is how exercise. That is one of the most uh, important ways of how exercise staves off aging, which a lot of people don't realize. The immune exactly. system robustification, because what happens yeah. as you get older? Your immune system yep. goes down. That's exactly. why you get cancer and things like that. Yep. So I'm trying to pitch hormesis, and there's a book called The HIT Bible, High Intensity Interval Training Bible. There's a number of books on HIT, but ask yourself if you can put that into your routine. Now, when we were training in, in high school, our, our, our good coaches made us do interval training at least once a week. Sometimes they made us do it twice a week. Now, HIT is not nearly as fun as doing a, a, a regular exercise, so ideally you do it with others. Mm -hmm. You get into a CrossFit or you get into some kind of a, you know, you go to your track once a week with your running group or whatever it is that you do, rowing, whatever. But add in the interval training, not just don't just do the regular stuff and you'll see your capacity improve. 
And I would argue that's really what Turchin is saying here, but he's saying it at the social level. Is socially, you want conflict. Don't run away from it. But understand how conflict, you can learn from it and regulate it. So the conflict end becomes more and more regulated. So eventually it becomes like the conflict happening inside of a, a well-built human brain, constantly arguing with yourself. And the systems that will lose, that information dies. Your brain uses long-term suppression. If you grow out of something that was you thought was ethical and then now suddenly you realize it no longer is, or maybe it was ethical for that situation but not today, you, you can long-term suppress that so it no longer affects your behavior, right? You almost entirely extinguish that information. So death and, and growth are built in to all complex systems. Death is as useful as life, but we want to make the death not informationally destructive. That's the key yeah. insight, if you will, is keep the, make the death with a lowercase d, and then the network is truly being gardened the way it should be, right? Because that's what life's trying to do. And Life that's is... what the internet partly suffices for as well. Perfect. Because um, I've Backs like, it the all reason up. I put on these Backs videos all for up. no yeah. uh, remuneration is so that someone else can build something off of this or they don't have to reinvent the wheel or learn You're things as slowly as we had to before the internet. Because you You're and the I are gardener. Really yes. You're thinking like that, a gardener, buddy. Someone should be much faster and build from there. Right. Uh, congratulations. You, uh, you deserve so much respect for doing that and for having this conversation. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to realize that we're all making some progress. And then another great thing Marcus Aurelius said is people who seem evil, just think of them as ignorant. He said, don't run away from them. Don't run away from the conflict. Tell them what you think is correct as, as, as gently as you can. They may not get it today, but it'll sit in the back of their brain, and then they'll get it in a year. They'll think that they came up with it, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> but, but don't run away from them, and try to help them where you can, because they, they don't see that good is winning over evil. So they think evil is good. That was his classic quote in the medit in meditations. They think evil is good. It's not. They don't see the world is becoming massively less violent, massively more highly regulated. Conflict doesn't go away. It just gets so sublimated, right? Mm -hmm. So the violence, lowercase v, the death, lowercase d, it's like that's the fundamentals of a well-built system. It's what I call coopetition in my both of my books we cooperate first and then we try and find ways to compete within a set of agreed upon rules coopetition de describes capitalism coopetition describes democracy coopetition describes human ethics cooperate first compete within if you ignore either of those if you ignore the competition the conflict the system's way less robust if you ignore the cooperation if you presume it doesn't exist you're just ignorant of how it works yeah. But it's it it's it is working, it is accelerating, it's protecting the system. And this is why I would argue this is one of the big insights I think we're gonna see. You know, my transcension hypothesis in my paper, I said what we're gonna see when we have good optical telescopes is we're gonna look out, we're gonna see all these uh Earth like planets closer to the galactic core, just wink out. <laughs> Because they're going to turn into these inner space things, right? They're going to basically... And, and then that what, would ex explain the transcendent hypothesis, which very few people are sold on. They're still, they right. still believe in the um, yeah. abundant intelligent civilizations right. uh, worldview. Because, you know, Carl Sagan believed that, and that was he did. perhaps he the did. best thought at the time. And Star it Trek was. It was the best like thought. That. It was the best but, thought. But as yeah. acceleration continues, I'm thinking... You know, it's it's harder and harder for there to be more like us and that we haven't found them yet. You could have thought that in 1980. That was reasonable. You could now, have. That's the right. The possibility of that existing is less. And transcension hypothesis mm -hmm. or equivalent mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the most logical conclusion once one understands acceleration. Yeah. Believe it or not, that uh, my colleague at the Evo Devil Universe community, Clement Vidal, he took this a little further and he realized, okay, in the process of creating this black hole-like structure, 
not only are these intelligences, these future Earths all over the Milky Way, going to take all of the resources of their neighboring planets and then reorganize them into computronium, they're going to eat their stars. They're yeah. going to suck all their stars. They're not going to need stars because they're going to, we almost can create fusion. We can almost create it today, right? Yeah. Trap local stars. They're going to take all that da- all that stuff and say, I don't need any of that. I'm making it all myself. And they're going to suck it all in. And so there's these black there's these binaries out there, lots of them that uh, black holes that are eating their local stars. And he believes some subset of those are intelligent. And he is searching for evidence with his SETI community, so-called techno signatures. What are the techno signatures? And he thinks these stellivores are a class of those is going to be the techno signatures. There's going to be some that are natural. If the whole system replicates, and it starts with a bacterial-like intelligence at first, yeah. and most of the replicators are going to have bacterial-like intelligence, just like on Earth. But a small subset are going to be like us, these super advanced systems. And, and that's somewhat related to the Kardashev scale from Nikolai Kardashev, because he was talking about energy, but he, he, he had this type 1, type 2 civilization. And he the was. stellivore that you talk about is similar to what he called the type 2, which is that using all the energy of your local star, but energy and computation should be seen as interchangeable, just like this is what was energy. missing. This is what was missing from Kardashev. Exactly. Yeah. Is that we, if we live in a so-called stemic universe, right? Space, time, energy, and matter create information and computation, right? Mm-hmm. If that's what's happening, right? And yeah, it's creating because it, even now every innovation in computation, even in the industry is about energy efficiency, just as yes. much as anything else. It's not, about cycles per second or teraflops. I would argue uh, it's about it's about I would argue it's about four efficiencies. It's about spatial, temporal, energy, and material efficiency. Yeah, and all reinforce is, all four reinforce each other. They do, and so that's why that's why I don't think you can get out of this acceleration. Is that seems baked in, and yeah, that, what we're talking about again is systems theory. We're talking about something that very few academics will study or talk about or acknowledge. And they will look back eventually at this and say, well, hey, all this stuff was out there. People wrote about this. We've been writing, I've been writing for 20 years. You've been writing it out for 10 or 15. It's obvious it's out there. When did, when did your book, Adam, come out? That was uh, early 2016. But there the you go. futurist goes back yeah. to uh, 2006. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So look at that. Look at that. Look how long that stuff has been out there. And people have not engaged with it. That's okay. They don't have to. The system's going to keep accelerating, and they're all going to misinterpret so much stuff. Like, yeah, they don't realize they're 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 floating on the wave. Because I have arguments with people, yeah. let's say on finance yeah. and economics matters. You would you'd be shocked at how many people just completely believe that we are poorer today than we were in 1913, 110 years ago, or whatever. Right. <laughs> right. People, there are people who absolutely adamantly believe that their arguments are extremely anecdotal and based on. And this is this is ridiculous. back to Marcus Aurelius's point. Yeah. How do you deal with those individuals? I think you deal with them with compassion, and you have empathy for them. They did not get the same education we did. They didn't have the same circumstances where we got to see the special circumstances where we got to see certain things that other people didn't our ability to reject the standard uh perspectives and see that they're culturally biased in many cases and question them whatever it is that the set of things that made us able to see that they can't get there right now they will though that's the thing we can we can have the certainty well okay we can have the theoretical hypothesis or the hypothesis, right? Yeah. That seems seems the most evidence based that they will get there. But we can have the belief. We can we can hold that belief strongly. So it's not a certainty in any in any scientific sense, but in a belief sense, it is. We've taken a leap of faith in a particular direction, and that allows us to pull out all these things, like all the reasons that I mentioned in the transcension hypothesis paper. Uh, why this acceleration has to keep going on. Yeah, and, uh, we and can pull that point, out. Um, because uh, we have to treat them with empathy, but they miss out on not just um, these uh, fascinating discussions, but even their financial decisions. For example, they think being in gold or silver or cash is correct, and they make 1% a year from that. And I say, no, the right. real safe haven 
Um, the closest thing to a mass available safe haven is something like the NASDAQ index, QQQ, and that's at a 12% right. or so gradient. And exactly. even though it sometimes falls 20%, it recovers faster. And if you're even remotely acceleration aware, that becomes much yep. more obvious than, say, put your money in gold because it's the safe haven. Exactly. And 50 years later, you have 1 20th of what you would have had if you'd been in the NASDAQ. Exactly. I, I And I think we can... Acceleration involves compression, right? One of the one of the ways you can describe intelligence itself is it's a representational compression in information and comp and simulation of these matter energy physical relationships, right? Of these dynamics. So we can say accelerware. That's a nice compression of acceleration. <laughs> yeah. I think I I think I coined that. I don't mind. I, I think years, you did too. Years. I never heard anyone else yeah. say it before you did. Yeah. And you yeah. linked to my blog, The Futurist, long before we actually met. Because that's where, because so, that's yeah. where you 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 beautifully stated the same thing that I was seeing, right? This dynamic that is universal and totally independent of my stuff. So independent and and relevant to actual people's lives now. That's what I keep yes. saying. In 1920, fine if you didn't care about it, it didn't affect right. you. Now right. you really miss out if you don't understand these things. So in my book, I call that. Accelerware investing, I call that D and D investing. Accelerware investing or D and D investing. So D and D is densification and dematerialization. Uh, the densification being the physical localization, miniaturization. Dematerialization being the uh, information uh, or digitization and simulation. Yeah. If you look at any country, you look at any of these Nasdaq companies, you can actually see. So QQQ is a great index. That's a great hedge. That should be your hedge, right? But then, yeah, but then, twenty percent of your investing can go into direct speculation to pick some, to cherry pick some things along those D and D axes, and say, I think these guys are localizing, miniaturizing, digitizing, and uh, simulating better than the others. And these guys are at the center of that network. And these guys are out on the edge of that network, and that's Absolutely, what that's um, what leads you to that's what that's what leads you to invest in Nvidia before anybody else does, or to hold Nvidia or or how Netflix was the natural progression of video delivery exactly, versus exactly exactly um, as recently as 2006. I give this example: What did someone yep. do if they want to see a movie? They drive to Blockbuster or Hollywood mm -hmm, Video, mm -hmm. pick out a cassette or DVD, drive right. back. Hopefully, the movie was good because if not, you still have to return it, drive back. So four yeah. legs of transport. Yeah. At a time, and you know how many video cassette rental stores there were even in 2004? So even yes. to the 21st century, yeah, there were 9,044 in the United States alone. Now there are oh, all my goodness. Done. Yeah, amazing. Dematerialization. Yeah. And the same thing for there you go. Uh, work from home, because some people say, no, you have to return to the office and this, then. I said, yeah, office once or twice a week, some hybrid. Apparently, model, apparently there is one blockbuster left in Alaska, by the way. Somebody yeah. just refused to take all the signs down. Yeah. So, so you can walk into this place. So there's in one out of nine thousand forty-four. You can, you can see, Alaska. yeah, you can see what the non-dematerialized, you know, past was like. <laughs> Actually, they could make money as a museum of non uh, yeah, museum of uh, pre-dematerialization exhibit. But to but even point, like work yes. from home because when yes. you think about it, the United States is still at um, only forty-nine, fifty percent of office capacity relative to pre-COVID. Exactly. It's not exactly. rising. That is nope. dematerialization of commutes because if you have people earning good money spending three hours a day commuting, that is wasteful. Absolutely. And dematerialization leads this prediction to be very easy. And therefore, even in a financial sense, um, people stuck in commercial real estate are in a problem. Technologies that enable this type of collaboration can do well because having highly educated people moving around versus the information moving to them is so much more dematerialized. All this becomes predictable. I try, uh, I think I have four pages on uh, Roth, or two or three pages at least, on Roth IRAs, and particularly the custodial Roth IRA, which you can set up for your kids as soon as they're earning an allowance. You know, that's one of the greatest tax giveaways for the average American is this custodial Roth and the Roth Especially itself. when you start early, because by the time yeah. you're 30, then you've already been compounding for 30 years. If I you're... think I give an example yeah. of the snowball, which is, you know, the first 20 years of that, you overestimate what the compounding will do. And then the second 20 years, you always underestimate because your psycho our psychology is not built to, to think, uh, to model exponential processes. Exactly. And so, so I think... 
I think if you max your Roth out and you put it into the D and D either QQQ or you put it into you know uh, QQQ plus twenty percent goes into cherry picking, and you pick a different one each year, just like a venture capitalist. Yeah, and you just sit and you hold. What do you get? I think I I, I assumed. I assume just a 12% return continuing going forward, which is conservative. You and I know that these cherry-picked leading ones are going to, because of the singularity, they're going to go faster and faster and create more and more of this digital value, right? Because it's just all digitized value, right? It's not in the physical, it's not limited by physical resources. It's the value of the network, which includes machines trading with machines, smarter and smarter machines going forward. So you just assume, you just assume the 12% and everybody retires a 50 millionaire. Everybody retires. Exactly. Because 12% is fast. It didn't exist before the modern age. And because it's digitized and, and dematerialized, the recovery is not that slow. So in the, you know, people who talk about the great depression, they say the stock market peaked in 1929 and it didn't get to that high again for 25 years. There's no chance of that in the modern age with, even right. a twelve percent gradation of investing in this manner, because the of, peaks and the valleys compress. Both. Yeah, peaks and valleys compress, and you won't be below your all-time high for more than eighteen, twenty months at a time. And even exactly if you right, by a few percent, so you won't have a nineteen twenty-nine through nineteen fifty-four malaise ever again like that. That's right. And I actually found the evidence that that it was actually shorter, a lot shorter than that. That was a famous kind of a miscalculation of it. Um, mm -hmm. It was our even back then. It was a lot shorter than the twenty-five years. Yeah, because the dividend they, reinvestment was off, um, not taken into account. They took the index value of the Dow thirty in and of itself. You know the details. You're the finance expert. Yes. So what are we saying here? We're saying to the average listener here that financial independence is actually quite simple now. If you're willing, quite simple, to put... and never before has the yeah. average person been able to have baseline material abundance so effortlessly and you don't so, have to be in the united states you can be in yep. many of the world's countries and so look up look at my three pages look at my three pages on uh, how to set up roth iras D, D investing in that book and do it actually put put a, put aside at least five thousand a year into this thing uh 7500 if you can max it out just put it aside do it for your kids I'm opening a Roth this year for my kid who's eight. She's just starting. So she's starting 10 years earlier on the snowball than the average person could at 18 because they don't even know that the custodial exists, right? Exactly. And what do you do? You've created a multimillionaire kids. And yeah, what at, you have to at 30, do, you have in to 22 do, years, she'll have a lot of money just passively from what you're setting up early. That's that's called crossover. The point yeah. at which your passive income increases, uh, outcompetes whatever salary you could make, is it, that for her is going to be in her early 30s. So mm -hmm. now she won't have to work in any salary job she doesn't want to. She can start any nonprofit or 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 company she wants and experiment. And so, and then beyond that, legacy. The legacy that you're going to have when you're in your 70s or 80s or 90s because of healthcare today, you have tens of millions that you have to give away. That's why I think you want to you want to give your kids three bank accounts. What I recommend is they have a spending account as soon as they're getting an allowance, spending account, a savings account, and a giving account, and 10% for giving, 20% for saving. Those are the two that are that are generally described, right? As because people tithe to their church ten percent, whatever. But if you require your kid in order to get their allowance to give away ten percent of their income every year, they think like a philanthropist from the very beginning. Now they might be giving it to their church or to uh, you know their kids' birth, their friends' birthday parties, but are they're, they're giving. They're realizing one of the fundamental purposes of wealth, right? Accumulation, to do something good, and then to give the whole way through, to try and help, to do the most help you can with those resources. So I think you can train kids not to be rich, miserable bastards yeah. if you do some simple hacks like that. I got that hack from a book called True Wealth Formula by Hans Johnson. It's one of the many books that I recommend, True Wealth Formula, Hans Hans Johnson. I totally recommend it. It'll tell you how to get out of debt. It'll tell you how to actually commit that 70% or commit that 20% to saving. 
and and not fight yourself, but to say, no, believe in the snowball, right? Yeah. So live live within your means. So yeah, we live in an amazing time. This pre singularity time is so incredibly amazing. And yet, like you say, most people are going to be distracted by fears, fires, and fancies, particularly people are less because... happy than forty years ago. They um, are. Even though yeah. Someone from 1980, like I study those poverty stats, UN yeah. Human Development Index, yes. and all that. Yes. In 1980, there were seven or eight countries that were considered advanced economies. By that yeah. same cutoff, whether by accident or deliberately, if it was deliberate, it was brilliant. They don't adjust the cutoff on a curve, they keep it absolute. And now about 110 countries qualify as advanced economies, including mm. Mexico and China, under the 1980 definition. I so see. people from 1980 would consider today to be materially very abundant. We're talking mm. over video like this, over 2,500-mile yep. distance, and we do it every day, and it's normal. It doesn't cost anything. Yep. And they didn't have things like that, yet people are less happy because of yes. all the other factors. Yes. And, and Let's talk about and, some of those factors yeah. briefly. Like, like wh why is it valuable to have a kind of a fear-based culture? It's valuable to have it if you live in a plutocracy, and that is the current economic environment. So much money is created, so much wealth is created by technology inside of democracies that when a new set of productive technologies emerge, you get this rapid rich-poor divide at first, and then eventually the divide closes because of creative destruction, because new technologies come in and you can't keep that 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 divide, and because of social entitlements, eventually the people on the bottom figure out how to get redistribution, and this huge divide that happened in uh, the 1800s with the Industrial Revolution was a perfect example of that. The Gilded Age, being in the 1890s in America, being a perfect example of like the peak of plutocracy, and what happens is the the wealthy capture the government and make it. Uh, subservient to their interests, take away a lot of the fairness of the competition, consolidate lots of industries. And most importantly, they create this kind of crisis perspective in the media because that totally serves their power interests. It yes. keeps everybody focused on the wrong things. Uh, you know, and it just is survive. so uncanny how it repeats and, and so yep. few people can see that the same tactic is... And this was again, this is this is the this is the information revolution. And so the whole thing that we saw there happened has happened in a tiny microcosm of it. And we've had we've had only seventy years of it. It didn't. It took you know two hundred years for the full cycle, you know seventeen seventy or whatever to the eighteen nineties, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the industrial revolution, we've just had it in in seventy years. And yet, I would argue. That eventually stops too. Right now, the media, the main media, is so dysfunctional and so negative yeah. that all the kids have tuned it out. And, but unfortunately, they're stuck in these toxic social media environments where there's so much fake news and clickbait, and that system doesn't have enough IA, doesn't have enough first level uh, intelligence built into it for them to be able to craft that environment the way that they want. Now, is that problem being solved in the whole network? It is. Since 2015, Google's rank brain, which is the neural network behind their page rank algorithm, has been smart enough to factually check every website against its knowledge graph, against its truth graph, right? So it has a model of the world. It's a statistical model. It's not a self-aware model. It's not a logical model, but it's a powerful enough model that they can punish any website that has three or more factual inaccuracies. And that's why when they turned on that truth graph in 2017, no, 2016, I think it was, or sorry, he searched vaccines, anti-vaxxer websites, which are highly ranked, you know, amongst certain people who don't understand evidence, they were like on page two, the top of page two, they were pretty high up. As soon as they turned that on, those sites went down to like pages 10 or 15 because they're full of factual inaccuracies. So what have I just described? I described a way of cleaning up toxic But that's still, but uh, that is still um, decided by Google. So there's the- Yes. There's the yes. notion that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so more there has to be competition for Google more, even in more, that function. Yeah, yes. You get right to the key issue, which is that we as consumers 
don't have control over that graph, we can't tailor the graph, and we can't see the evidence behind the graph. And mostly, from my earlier discussion about toxic social media, that graph is not being used on Facebook or Twitter or any of these other platforms because not or YouTube because there's no money in it. There's no money in it. If we if they gave that power to us, they wouldn't be able to throw a car ad or a Wheaties ad or any other shit that we're not going to ever buy again at our faces because it's the highest because it it, it won the bidding war. Yeah. And so they're going after maximum profit extraction, which, you know, naturally you'd expect them to do that, but there's no countervailing regulation or oversight or mechanisms that give us personal control over that. Personal well, how AI is that going to change that. Um, and do you see that correction being benign I, or uh, turbulent? I, th I, I, I see that correction coming coming gale force toward us now, and it will be turbulent, but I think in the long run, it'll be hugely beneficial. So example, right now, there's a number of companies that have just stood up these things called personal AIs, right? So a personal AI is a large language model that has a model of your interests, your values, your goals, your tasks, right? And it starts to advise you on what to read, what to watch, who to connect with, even how and to what to tune out over to how to and, how to buy, how yeah. to buy, what to buy, how to vote, what language you might want to get a bunch of people all agreeing, and then in initiative politics, ram it right up into the legislature in your local county or state or government or, or federal government eventually, right? The powerful actors are all going to try and rewrite the rules of initiative politics because these tools are going to be so powerful. But they are going to lose because they don't have all the votes. Unless you take away the votes, unless you give more votes to people who have more money. But de facto, that's what they're doing now, too. They're doing you know, their best. Yeah. They're doing their best. But it's Special a Special interest in lobbies. And it's a rear guard. It's a rear guard action. Take it from the biggest perspective and see what happened in the industrial, the industrial Revolution all the way to the 50s. And what did we get? We got stronger and stronger middle class, more and more uh, redistribution tools and institutions. And civil a rights, massive reduction civil in rights. crimes of poverty. Exactly. Yeah. And all of those things, all of those things eventually. So from a network perspective, right, there's two networks here. There's the hierarchy network, which is very valuable when you need everybody to all uh, hew to one particular standard. But that is not a complex, that's not a high complexity environment. That's not an abundance environment. That's a scarcity environment and a conflict environment. That's when these, that's when this hierarchical network wins. So if, you, if they can convince you that it's scarce, scarcity and conflict are the huge issues then that network perspective is going to win and you're going to be, everyone's going to be worshiping the ultra rich. Oh, I'm so happy. Everybody's, you know, these super ultra rich are running everything on the top. That's so great. I want to be one of those one day. I watch rich and famous, you know, maybe I will. Right. So that, that works in scarcity and conflict. As soon as you have abundance, it becomes freedom and experimentation values. It's not these developmental values. You need that. By the yeah. way, you need that you need that top down control. That's development. But you also need these evolutionary values. Oh, I need individuals to be empowered as much as possible to try their own thing. That's what personal AIs are going to do. They started this top down thing and only the powerful actors have them, the tech titans have them and they maximize extraction with it. Then they get cheap enough that they commoditize and that is what is coming for us. It's coming for us like a bright hurricane and, and, and it is almost it. it is overwhelmingly a positive because you still see very negative ideologies um very outdated ideologies you see um let's say um race-based ideologies or something where there's still people even in 2023 will say well these countries have a lower iq and therefore they could never catch up and right. this is a natural order but when you have personal ai so what if yep. even if one bought that yeah. So what if someone is less intelligent, someone's more intelligent, but the other 98% is the AI, so the difference between those two people is greatly nullified. In that's one way of looking at it. Another, they have another, the same yep, tool. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is 
this is going to sound dangerous, but we actually selectively forget real aspects of the world that we don't like. If it turns out, for example, that one race is slightly more genetically uh, intelligent than another, which is one of these huge controversies everybody gets their knickers all twisted over, we don't want that future. Yeah. So we're going to continue to interbreed. We're going to continue to gene edit whatever it is so that everybody has that same equity. So we forget those aspects of reality don't, and don't even discuss them because we're going to create the future that we know is the most adaptive. If there are accidents of histor historical evolution that have created these bad things, if we tend to be more impulsive or more evil in whatever way, we're still going to look at the positive of where we could be, of where, let's say, 99% of us are, and we see the people who don't have that, and we're going to figure out how to help them because that's the future that we want. Yes, we put them in boxes at first if we can't help them, but later we're going to be nudging them along from birth. These personal AIs that everybody is going to be growing up with, they're going to be, you're, you're reaching for a cigarette and it's going to remind you, are you sure you want to do that? Because you told me you're trying to quit. Why don't you take this nicotine gum or do this or that, right? That's going to be a piece of us that's learning like a kid its entire life accelerating the way you and I totally see it. Now let's talk about some of the negatives of it though first, because we, we don't want to be Pollyanna-ish here. When those things first emerge, people are going to use their personal AIs. Well, first they're going to probably come from most of the powerful actors. Yeah. The open source ones come later. Those are the ones that keep everybody honest, right? The open source ones that are built by kids in their dorm rooms, they're really trying to empower individuals. The Amazon one is just going to be maximizing yeah. Amazon's Amazon's you know uh, profit and trying to try to entertain you in the process. But when these things come out, people are going to structure them, many of them, just to collect, just to have information that reflects their current biases. Yeah. So they'll be able to maintain their ignorance in these little bubbles. Exactly. And if they, yeah. if they grew up on Fox News, they're going to stay this, you know, the world is falling apart and I need these strong men. And, and all the boutique ideologies, because even yeah. within a party, right, there'll be a Republican yeah. blog, yep. for example, right. that is That's entirely right. about military industrial complex and every war is justified in war, war, war all the time. And there'll be another yep. part, still considered part of the right, but is entirely mm -hmm. the opposite. No wars. Um, can we cut off for the rest of the world? But we believe that um, there's a racial hierarchy, this, this, this. So these are even just two parts of what is called the right that have no overlap with each other at all. But each each of those websites will have many thousands of its own subscribers because they just want confirmation bias. Yes. Even if you post links from one onto the other, even though they're both under what's called the right, um, whether that's even accurate categorization or not, they completely is. reject the other sites out is. of hand. Yep. Yes, good point. Well, this allows me to wave another book that I really recommend. It's called The Difference by the um, complexity scientist uh, and politician, uh, political scientist Scott Page. He's here at the University of Michigan, just down the road from where I live here in Ann Arbor. And where I went to also for my MBA. Yeah. Yay! Congratulations. I didn't know that. So the subtitle is How the Power of Diversity Creates Better Groups, Firms, Schools, and Societies. So he collected evidence for all four of those groups, firms, schools, societies. And what he showed is cognitive diversity crushes cognitive narrowness for all the unstructured problems, all the hard or so-called wicked problems, like what strategy do you want to, do you want to use, you know, if you're in marketing or whatever, right? Uh, it's not for not something... Cognitive diversity, not uh, right. perspective diversity. So what is cognitive diversity? It, it it's it's a multi-axis thing, right? Yeah. It's not the diversity that we hear in a typical DEI, you know, uh, setting, where you know it's ethnic diversity, let's say, or racial. I think diversity, but uniformity of thought in many cases. <laughs> right, right. Is often required. Yes, although obviously ethnic diversity does uh, correlate with uh, perspective and experience diversity, skills diversity. When you finally do, though, see what the key diversities that you want are, what you can do is all these diagnostics. I've got a pile of them in my book, right? Like the Strengths Finder diagnostic, the 34 workplace strengths, and then I add six more from Foresight, so that's 40 strengths. 
you can see what the strengths diversity is on your team. And if you're not, if you don't have a few of those strengths, you can go out and get them. And that's going to allow you to create much better organizational strategy. If you take the Strengths Finder, the Gallup Strengths Finder $50 test, it'll rank your 34 top to bottom. And what you'll discover when you look at the bottom five, you look up what they are, you probably ridicule those strengths today. Yeah. There's a reason you don't have those strengths. Yeah. You don't really see that they're super valuable under these certain circumstances. So yeah. what makes a strength diverse team or a cognitively diverse team? It's a group that has enough of a systems perspective to realize I need those people under those circumstances. So that gets us back to values and to this book, The Righteous Mind, which I recommend everybody listening buy this book. It's the only one I'm going to recommend of all these ones that you really should buy, even over my book, right? Yeah, I recommend hey. that people buy John's book as well, but uh, he's Good. recommending this one. Yeah. So why, why, okay, why is Jonathan Haidt, what is, he, what is he after here? Something called moral foundations theory which is what are the universal values that all cultures have? Now, in the 70s, they didn't think there were any because you can always find for any value you th that you is putatively universal, you can find a culture that doesn't express that value very much at all. So for a long time, the cultural relativists thought, oh, no, there's no universal values, right? And then in the last 20 years, social psychologists doing a lot of more careful experiments and particularly with young kids found that before they are, you know, the age of five, we, we have all these values. We've got them all. We've got all these. There is this subset of values. He found seven. And I found an eighth one. I'm writing a paper now arguing the one that he missed, that these are universal values. And so what are they? Well, Four of them are conservative and four of them are liberal. <laughs> More accurately, four of them are evolutionary values in a, in a social system, and four of them are developmental values. Well, let's talk about the evolutionary ones, the liberal ones, the ones that champion, diver champion um, experimentation and exploration like, like life does, like evolutionary processes do. Well, the bottom one is freedom. You got to have freedom to be able to create diversity. The second one is diversity, the valuing of diversity, of skills that you don't have, but seeing them, seeing the value, and of course, specialization, Adam Smith's fundament, one of his fundamental tenets is critical, right? You cannot get specialization without a commitment to diversity. So you've got those two. Then above that is equity, and the liberal Groups totally understand that we 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 traditionally call that social justice, right? Everybody having not equality, it's equality of opportunity, if you will, or everybody having a stake in the system, and nobody being marginalized, equity, right? Social justice. Above that is care, just caring and empathy for others, truly feeling like realizing that they're you they're just different versions of you right that 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 and that you try and understand their way of thinking walk in their shoes okay what's on the what's on the conservative side top one is sanctity which is another term for ethics with hierarchy in them if you have an ethical system and you have higher and lower in that system you have a uh, perspective on, on the sacred, right? This is where all religion came from as our first natural philosophy, right? Higher and lower values. I have a system of ethics that describes those. Now, the left very often gets caught in uh, postmodernism or cultural relativism because it doesn't realize that there is this, there is this hierarchy, right? The right says, no, there's definitely a hierarchy, and I'm telling you what it is, and you have to follow it. <laughs> What's below this value of sanctity, which every human has, right? The next one down on that right bell curve, in my opinion, is um, proportionality. So instead of social justice, it's economic and criminal justice, right? People who work harder should get more. The left mm -hmm. doesn't think about that. People who may do more bad things should get more punishment. The yeah. left, again, reluctantly accepts that, right? And then the two most extreme on the right, loyalty and authority, right? Got to have loyalty, which balances diversity, and you've got to have authority, which balances freedom, right? 
So you, there is a truth. There's objective truths out there, and those are sources of authority. And so the people on the so so the right values they flourish under scarcity and conflict, and the left values flourish under abundance. Now, you interestingly, if you think from an international perspective, the value systems one can wonder how universal are these because, like. Some countries don't produce a lot of scammers. Some countries produce a lot of scammers. Now, I can tell you something in this way. If you go to India, and sure. especially, let's say, the northwestern part of India, Gangetic Belt, where Hinduism right. originated. Now, if you go people there, the yeah. value system is different. Yes, um, Eating beef over there would be considered a much worse thing than um, right. hacking into someone's bank account and stealing their money. Now, Right, I, but, but, all the, Western... but all the elaborate scams, if you go to Mark Rober, go to Mark yeah. Rober's videos on YouTube and all the elaborate scams that he has traced back from, you know, happening to like seniors in America to, you know, to North India, their value system is that's just, that's an acceptable game, right? That's an acceptable game for them to play. They actually think that, and I'm yep. very angry about that because I mean, I got my account hacked by them as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And it took a lot of effort to get most of my money back and still ongoing. Now, I'll be the first to say, well, Western civilization is better in terms of, uh, in a superficial sense, saying that, well, stealing yep. is wrong, obviously, and that's why there's crimes for penalty, but I was thinking in an evolutionary sense, see, Islam has extremely severe penalties for theft, extremely mm -hmm. severe, or severe, often hand chopping. And I thought, is that merely a reaction to they encountered these people who don't think stealing is wrong, you know, 1300 years ago. So they said, well, no, stealing is very wrong. We chop off your hand type of thing. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about universal values, that difference in that, is it because of different prosperity levels? Because why 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 is eating beef considered bad? Because well, I think it is. I think it's a lot. A lot of people yes. are starving, and they, that's no, why they market vegetarianism. I think you're exactly hitting on it. Is that we live in an evolutionary developmental world, which means every one of those cultures has taken a different evolutionary path to yeah. this developmental destination we call progress. So each path is going to be path dependent. It's going to have its own unique cultural uh, affordances. And it's going to take a while for it to be able to see what that universal is. It, it, it's, this book really describes a lot of that. One of the beautiful yeah. things it does, though, is it recognizes how valuable the diversity is. Because you and I will remain value specialists among those eight. Uh, you know, he, he describes the two kids growing up. One goes conservative and one goes liberal. And they're both really valuable under different circumstances under different constraints. And so, you know, when 9-11 happens, we just gravitate to the right values. And then we, we do this, all these new hierarchies, we take away a lot of freedoms. And then we get this period of sustained abundance. We gravitate to the left values because that's what the network, that's, that's what's most adaptive for the network. But not everybody yeah. gets those, the benefit of those, those same kinds of learning curves. They're going to get the, or those same conditions, they'll get them, they'll get different sets depending on, as you're saying, their their religious beliefs, their economic history, the level of consolidation that exists, where or they the are. In the... Stealing from people you don't have to be face to face with. So it right. uh, whatever moral right. restraint there might be is lower and, than they can and, and even the well, even they, they even the concept anyway. even the concept of property yeah. is different, right? How private is private property? Or does everybody or should everybody be able to share everybody else's stuff, right? under circumstances of adversity. If I'm adverse, do I have a right to, um, you know, I mean, the international law is not prosecuting intellectual property theft the same way yeah. in these emerging countries as it does in the rich countries. So like everything, you know, there's all these situational ethics that are truly adaptive, differently adaptive depending upon the conditions, the economic, socioeconomic conditions of the, uh, and political conditions so of that So are you still... Culture optimistic that after a messy process universal values win out versus this is many let, let this, let, that, let's that talk the about the societies simple. get dragged down and we uh, and that messes things up yeah. let's talk about the simple one first do i believe the cognitive the, the people who set their personal ais to be evidence-based mm -hmm. are going to out compete the people who set their personal ais filters or filter bubble for home or, or confirmation bias feel good yes yeah and i and i am very optimistic of that okay so i do believe that there's two futures there's the wally future and the incredibles future 
we can wallify ourselves, right? Like in the movie Wally, and become yeah. dependent and weak and, and de evolve. Or we can incredibilize ourselves with these tools. So it's the lean back or the lean forward, right? The filter yeah. bubble, or what's the lean forward look like? The lean forward says, well, I want you, Pi, personal AI, right? Uh, digital Kartik, I want you to advise me on the most evidence based thinking I should be understanding. And I want you to advise me on the values that don't necessarily reflect my own that I should understand so that I can at least value them and I can get help from people who have those skills when I need it. So there's a website called Ground News, and they have this thing called a blind spot. And this website actually has two columns. It shows you the right and the left like media that are out there in the in the in the media sphere and it shows you if you if you are particularly right it shows you the top articles that came out on the left that are most um highly sure. valued by people who share your values so it shows you the ones you really should understand and find the common ground and this is how you create that center column. This is how you keep the system from polarizing dysfunctionally. Mm. Instead, it's this got to be this beautiful bell curve where, yeah, most people are centrists, but it's truly valuable to have the, this extreme right under these circumstances and this extreme left under these other circumstances. And in most cases, though, the closer you are to the center, the more benefit the whole network will get. Uh, to me, I think it's the future of network science. I think network science is going to tell us that, yes, we want to be value specialists, but at the same time, we want to recognize this distribution and protect ourselves in those cases where we need the values uh, diversity. And in other cases, we will specialize. It's back again to this fundamental, you know, half the time you're just trying to optimize. The other half you're trying to create variety in experiments because you don't know what the next thing should be. And you need to respect all of those experiments because when the next catastrophe comes, only a few of those are going to be the leading ones. And in fact, you should impose the catastrophe yourself to create as much hormesis as you can. Mm. Impose it, stress test your banks, create the conditions where the system is getting review, feedback loop. The, the, the do loop, which we haven't discussed, is one of the other fundamentals. All complex systems are learning, looking ahead, doing, and reviewing. Alpha, learn, foresight, action, review. And if you're not doing all four of those steps, you can't get the replication cycle, right? Because that's- Indeed, I, that's why I, I keep screaming to a lot of economists who have connections to the central bank that don't just buy treasuries and MBSs. Experiment with sending cash directly to people, tax rebate. All these experiments for robustification because by just yeah. distorting two sectors, through quantitative easing, which they still believe they don't have to do again yet for the fifth or sixth time they've had to do it again. Yeah. Embrace that as normal, broaden the pipe in experimentation, you create more robustification rather than mm -hmm. um, more fragility is what they're doing now because they're bubbling, they're creating distortions and bubbles in just two areas, treasuries, meaning government spending, mm -hmm. and mortgage-backed securities, meaning right. house price bubble, while, while vital life energy is being taken away from the rest of the economy. Well said, yes. this. Uh... This diversity, recognizing the diversity of all the useful ways of adjusting an economy and really believing and how, in how the bottom cost up. of experimentation is so low that yeah. why are you afraid to experiment? So you send some, some of the cash directly to people instead of buying treasuries where it reaches people anywhere through a fiscal welfare state, which is so I, much less efficient. I do believe that a lot of it is just to do with the the levels of plutocracy that exist it's the neat, it's just the natural thing to do when you know most of the leaders like say of the FTC or the FCC or any of these they're basically they're there to settle disputes between two or three warring ultra wealthy interests yeah. that's really what they're there for to 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 adjust the rules a little bit so that robber baron a gets a little bit more than baron b and they're operating in a way that's kind of that's largely disconnected from the average concerns of the average person, but that system naturally reorganizes itself. And this is where I think we haven't talked about, say, for example, the universal basic income or any of these redistribution methods. But I do believe 
I don't think you could ever sell universal basic income to the right because they can see all these examples, all these situations where... Uh, I know that. Believe me, I tried. I even paired universal basic income with 0% income tax, saying yes. that automation makes up the difference. Even that right. cannot be sold to the right because they're right. More opposed to yeah. consolidation of benefits that already exist, not increase, just consolidation of them to make right. it 40% more productive. Right. And for all this talk of lower tax, I give them a path to 0% tax. They don't want mm -hmm. that. They're more interested in cutting the tax rate by 2 percent so that they can make a very small difference. Any too large of a change is also right. another resistance to them. So they are dancing on the head of a pin that they say they want something, but they also don't want drastic changes. So they say, yep. I think that every everybody has some legitimate points here. And the better we understand what kind of redistribution truly is most uh, beneficial for the network, then you'll see countries gravitating that direction. But more importantly, you'll have the evidence of their innovation and their levels of satisfaction being just so much higher. Because when you have what I call the value cosm, which is the values, the goals, the complaints graph, all these graphs that your personal AI is going to have. If I'm using any tool, I've argued that you know, in 20 years, if I'm using, I'm picking up a tool and I'm using it, if I can't complain about that tool at point of use yeah. and have that complaint go up into the graph, into the public graph, or it'll go to the private user of that tool if they're giving me some, some monetary benefit. Otherwise, it'll go to the public graph. There'll be this graph of all the pain points that people have. And why would I buy a, a, a product that doesn't have that ability, right? If, why can, why that doesn't allow my personal AI to interact with it in that way? It's like it's so much better for the whole network to see those pain points and then for the new entrepreneurs to come out and fix those those things. And and when the network gets that powerful, when the graphs, when all of the graphs get that powerful in combination with the personal AIs that are creating the local data models that we're using that are in an encrypted private cloud, by the way, just like our text and emails, right? That's not going to be something the marketers have. Within 20 years, Possibly 10, you and I are going to have an encrypted private data model that's better than the one the marketers are using to micro-target us. So if we're and nudging that reform government because the example I always give is, as you said, a restaurant has to give everyone a five out of five experience or they get a negative Yelp review that can damage their business. Same goes for a dry cleaner. Yet people so it, are... It's going to granularize. accept two out of it's, 10 uh, results from the government... It's going to and granularize. You can't complain about it. The five out of five, everybody will get a five, but there'll be a five A, B, C, right? I mean, yeah. it, it'll always granularize so that there'll be some way to like address the psychology of everybody wanting to know that, yes, I'm in this top level. But at the same time, that, that to me is like the equity thinking. That's the social justice thinking. Everybody gets a star for participating. But yeah. then, um, then there's the proportionality thinking on the right, which is just as important. You have to be able to... It create a merit scale and see so, so who's can doing it make better. the government improve because the government yes is... i think i think that nat i think naturally these systems do that i think our own bodies do that i think we're mm. constantly we're constantly competing and and comparing every 30 days um the female ovarian cycle has to come up with the single fittest egg that is a chemical competition between a bunch of eggs that are close to being ovulated, and then a selection of only one to come out. And if that competition didn't happen, you'd have far less fit eggs in that fallopian tube. Yep. Constantly, the system is ranking, and yet it's also giving all these resources to the whole system so that each one can try their own unique approach. And I, that feels to me fundamental to how good complex systems work, that network eccentricity. And I, I know, think it's, it's that amazing. You know, gonna, my think, uh, mother yeah. is one of 11 siblings, hmm. and I got a good data set to look at among those aunts and uncles of mine. And they, they look similar in certain ways, but all very different in many other ways. Yeah. yeah. Let me give you an example of, of a, a universal basic income that I think does work. I think Denmark's flex security works. So Denmark has a system where you get a universal basic income, essentially, as long as you're looking for work. Now, if you combine that with once you find work, you get a supplement from the state 
if your work is like caring for an elder or a nonprofit or going back to school or whatever, so that's not going to earn you a living wage. You get a supplement up to the living wage. If you combine those two together, I think you finally have something you can sell to both sides. You have something that doesn't create dependency, like all the like like yeah. Saudi Arabia's citizens all became incredibly dependent on all the oil money handouts, right? Or the poor dependencies of the on the reservations in in uh, in the First Nations peoples in North America, right? Uh, now, these... now um, a counterpoint of that, okay, that mm. works in Denmark, full of Danish people. Yeah, many centuries before this program came, conditions of that place create a certain type of people. Now, yes. like I said, in certain parts of India, northeastern part of India, for, as an example, one could say a place like Nigeria as well. A lot of people don't think stealing is wrong. What they consider ethical or not ethical is very different. Yes. A system like that obviously would not work today. People would just try to game the system as their default instinct. But through the improvement of the system and eventual convergence to universal values, would we yes. get to a point where all parts of the world could get to the point where they would behave as well and not abuse the system the way Danish people got to a point that they wouldn't abuse such a system. Yes, my argument would be that the system becomes more developmental over time. It, 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 those universals become more obvious. And yes, there will still be differences culturally, but the 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 the, the, the strength but of a the minimal universal will get stronger. Yeah, yeah. And where and where does the true where does the true evolution happen in all of these evolutionary developmental transitions? The true evolution always happens at the higher level. Mm -hmm. So the evolution is going to be in ways of uh, of types of consciousness, ways of of computing that these super brains are using or whatever, right? And then the tool, the experiments that they're doing in this virtual space. There'll probably be all these massive virtual arguments or, or, or competitions for solving all these complex scientific and other optimization challenges in that virtual space. Those markets are going to be where all the money's made. Right in the post singularity world, it's not going to be in this physical stuff. We're yeah. going to be looking. We're going to be looking at this physical stuff. If, a, if an alien came, it's going to look like this relatively inert matter that's been pretty much optimized for certain things. But what it's doing in this virtual space is all still deeply, yeah, no, and, and almost deeply all the net new money created is almost even now almost entirely in knowledge based and and uh, dematerialized items. So the virtual space becomes the the end game for everything and all the physical is just the maintenance infrastructure. Yes. And so I think that to the extent that those systems are, well, in biology, they're based on much slower moving physics, right? Yeah. And as we upload more and more of those algorithms into the technology, it'll be more and more obvious your digital you is going to be nudging you better and better toward those things. And yeah, It'll know very well when stealing is allowed, or what one might they might call it borrowing, whatever, and when it's not. Or even and just tell be... you, this is the long term consequence of doing it. See, a lot of crimes are just not long term thought. If exactly. your personal AI tells you, hey, you may not want to do this because this, this, and this will happen, exactly. that, and that, that could deter at least a good percentage of. Well, you know, I shouldn't have been so mad that I shot the person type of crime. And and yeah. I and I and I think that's. You know, this can sound Pollyanna-ish, but at the same time, we can recognize that even if that future is the inevitable future that we think, there will be all these growing pains on the way there. We yeah. haven't described the adaptation curve, which is the idea, and this is in my book, that first-generation technologies are usually dehumanizing. Yes. They get the interface wrong, or they're too primitive, or they're, you know, controlled by, like, plutocratic plutocratic actors rather than network actors. So then second generation stay dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. And then with luck and good design, the third generation become net humanizing. Exactly. And, and the second generation stays dehumanizing because money was made in the first generation. So that's the template that people want to duplicate. That's what investors fund and that create and that status quo stays throughout that second generation before someone yeah. goes to a higher paradigm. You, I could give many, many examples. The automobile online dating, all of the above, we can see examples of, of various stages of each of those. Yes, it's, uh, I used to call it my third law of technology. Yeah, <laughs> this is like so obvious that there's these obvious features of, of technology, but technology is also a learning system. 
This is why you have to chuckle a little about the people who talk about all the biases in uh, in neural nets. Yes, yes, human designers bake in biases, but if it's a learning system, it's going to learn its way out of the bi out of the out of the biases. Just like so many uh, of these, even primitive AIs have learned themselves out of their biases. So that's the future of like algorithmic auditing and all of these oversight tools is to recognize that, yeah, those biases exist. These problems are going to happen, but the system is going to correct itself out. And exactly, we just need because to it's even in a funny those... sense, like there are certain things in the United States that are major crimes that are not crimes in other Western countries even. And the reverse mm -hmm. is also true because of either cultural bias in certain case law at a certain time that just persists and, and nobody re-looked at it for a long time versus now. And right. uh, it's very interesting how those anachronisms are scattered out. Because, for example, in France, they were executing people via guillotine by law all the way up till 1981. The final execution was 1977, not 1877, 1977, well within both of our lifetimes. Same year as Dragon of Eden came out was when France's final guillotine execution was. Because that persisted for so long, then they went to no death penalty at all, not electric chair in between. Similarly, in the United States, until the mid 80s, there were laws on the books in Southern states that any miscegenation into racial breeding or marriage was in fact illegal. That was true until the mid eighties in Louisiana, Alabama, mm -hmm. places like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so just even yep. within Western countries, certain things persisted for very long. Just Absolutely. Got, and I think, um, I think, I think we have to, I think we have to have empathy yeah. and then work out the ethics. Empathy yeah. comes, like I say in my book, empathy comes first. If you don't have enough empathy, you can't even figure out what the ethics should be. And those yeah. ethics are going to shift. They're going to keep shifting, right? If I was yeah. going to... And, and then that goes to... even to why those people don't think stealing is wrong because they don't have the empathy and they can rationalize, well, it's okay there you to go. steal. And there you uh, go. But where's your empathy? You know, we have to figure steal. out how to expand their empathy. Yeah. And this, you know, this gets back to Teilhard de Chardin's book, The Phenomenon of, of Humanity, right? Mistranslated mm -hmm. as the phenomenon of man, but it's actually the phenomenon of humanity. Yeah. 1955, and he argued the newest sphere is being is emerging. We truly do have a newest sphere on this planet right now. We are as one network. We actually are one whole species. It's a new book called "We Are Agora" mm -hmm. by my friend Byron Reese, the technologist that's just come out. We are Agora, and Agora for him is this network humanity. It's the thinking layer of all humans with their technology. And he argues that we can't even see it. It exists, but we can't directly experience it because we have our individual consciousness, but that consciousness is also emerging. And so we're going to see it more and more clearly the more intelligent all these nodes get. And that network consciousness is going to help create that developmental regulation. And then, of course, there'll be all the new accelerations that happen with the, with the minds on top of that network, the most complex versions of that, mm -hmm. that will go into something that isn't interconnecting, but instead is exploring. Exactly. But, but, but that network self is, it's already deeply existing. And there's a book called The Neuroscience of Human Relationships by Lewis Cozzolino, who's a psychologist mm -hmm. and a clinical therapist. And he talks about how we're actually deeply organized for this. There's actually a social synapse between us, just like neurons have that synapse yeah. between them and they decide how to communicate. You and I are constantly deciding how to communicate, what emotion to bring. Uh, and we're constantly watching and learning from each other and motivating each other towards one path or another. I want to leave that one last thought, the neuroscience of human relationships, the idea that we are, we're already this, there's a social, there's a bunch of, that social synapses exist. That's his, that's his first chapter, is that we truly actually are, connection is one of the most important things. Quality connection, truly being understood, having empathy for each other, that's deeply built in to the power of human cooperativity. We're mm -hmm. doing that with this community. And I want to thank you again for everything you're doing to help people see these bigger pictures. And uh, if you want to look at any of my stuff, 
Uh, you can go to my blog, uh, eversmarterworld.com, uh, or you can find me on Medium, uh, John, John M. Smart, or you can find me on Substack. I have a newsletter there called Natural Alignment, the future of AI alignment, natural alignment, how AI is becoming more biological uh, as I think kind of the inevitable future of it. So um, thank you so much for this time. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, and you. thanks for making the time to speak with yeah. me. You're an awesome guy, buddy. Thank you so much for, for this opportunity. Absolutely. Thanks. Talk soon. Talk soon.